marks. Um, how many of you are from school business? Oh, the majority of you are far. How about from the communication side, from the humanity side? Very nice. Glad that you're all here. And, uh, and I hope to uh, say a few things. And Maurice, I don't know, can you hear this? If that's important. Yes. Please? Great. All right. Um, it's really nice to be here, I should say, yeah, in advance. Tell me, because I can't hear right if it gets too loud or blue. Um, thank you to Lynn and to Bish, Carol, the great uh, Tom, the great folks who have invited me, instructors, professors, into the classroom this week. It's been a great return <clears throat> trip for me to uh, really. It was, by the way, the microphone's being held on with a paper clip. So in the event that this, I have a technical malfunction, I hope you'll bear with me and I'll try to address that. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful. It was 30 years or so ago when I was on this campus and most of you weren't around then. Uh, and, and coming back and this return uh, has really been uh, personally a lot of fun. I, I left here after getting my master's degree as a, a naive young person, not, sharing, not sure about what he's going to do, and I come back here uh, this week as a naive older person, absolutely not sure with what he's going to do with the rest of his life. Uh, it's been a great, it's been a, a, a really nice opportunity for me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about, and I'm assuming this is, a, you're, you're here, it maybe is a modicum of interest to you, how I ended up uh, at UNC, what I did in my time in the advertising world, and a few things I've learned along the way that have proved to be of value to me. Uh, and with that, I have tried to keep a lens on that said, you guys are going to be looking for jobs if you aren't already. And so I'm hopeful that it would be somewhat uh, helpful to you with regard to that search. My, uh, my, my turning here. Hello? I don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give this to you. I don't know if you're here so I can keep talking. This time is more stupid. Like what it was like to work in a modern advertising agency. 
Um, uh, but I, it was also, uh, it, it was drop job, it's like I learned it later on, it was really a drop job training for me. It was just, not, wasn't just my first experience in the educational world, it was, I was in job training. It was like a learning lab. Sorry, I did my own slides, so we're just going to leave that as the disclaimer for right now. <laughs> and you can blame somebody at some point along the way. Uh, what I, what I really did learn in this junior high school teaching experience was it was, it was a laboratory for me. And I don't hear me saying this a bunch of times. I just kept on learning. I, got, I was lucky. It was really about small group, developing small group communication skills, organizational behavior. Seminars took place every 15 minutes when somebody was going off on something that the principal called me in or those kinds of things. I got public speaking practice, which I really didn't have as, as somebody who his way into, uh, into teaching. It was about management and leadership training and the same kind of lessons learned. I was learning the essential skills to compete in an American corporation. I didn't know it at the time, but that's what was, what was happening. I learned uh, some important lessons. Uh, I did move to a different school the next year. I didn't know uh, until much later that something had actually happened in Kersey uh, at Platte Valley High School. Five years and well into my advertising career at that point, the phone rang and there was a young woman on the line, her name was Campbell. Uh, and it turns out she was the senior class president who'd been charged with representing the school's search for a commencement speaker for that year. I'd been part of their uh, lives for only one period a day for their seventh grade English class. And she called me and asked me if I could come back and be the commencement speaker. Pre Google. To this day, I don't know how she found me. There are times, and I know you're probably wondering right now, what's the difference? Well, how am I going to make a difference in the world? Well, this little experience for me, this little, this little pocket of time for me, was uh, huge because it turns out I didn't know it until six or seven years later when I was thinking about could I make it, what difference did it make? And it actually, it actually made me. And it was a it was an amazing experience. I had worked with the most famous writers, art directors, creative directors worked with corporate heads and infamous and famous, even more infamous than famous, and traveled the world doing my job. But this is probably the greatest professional honor I've ever, ever received. I wasn't yet at this point in time even close to imagining a career in the business world. Not even close. Never even done it. What I did learn through that experience, I've alluded to this a bit, is about that it was applied, sorry, I, I learned a lot about uh, life. I was a single guy in Greeley. Some of you know what that's like. <laughs> Maybe not 30 years ago. Uh, but I did learn about a teaching assistant's position here at the University of Speech Communication Department. So I returned to Greeley that summer. Uh, I applied for and did receive that, which was, a, uh, which was great. Um, I took a really, really creepy job on campus here as a night watchman in a dorm in the summer, and it's I, and Bob and I, I, it was a dorm really close to this building. I had no idea what it was. And again, it was, it was pretty dated, and there were some summer school uh, students in about three rooms on the first floor, and all I remember is having to kind of patrol three floors in the darkness. It was terrifying, <laughs> and I hated it. But I have I have a bed, and that uh, that was really helpful. Um, I did uh, take classes in, in things like rhetorical criticism. A few who will know this, argumentation, persuasion, communication, and law. And I taught, and I'm not quite sure that this is how it's done anymore, interpersonal communication, nonverbal communication, as a sole instructor uh, for those students. Of the papers I've, uh, 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 sorry, control here. Very good. Of the papers that I wrote, the tests I took, and, and uh, the classes that I, I, I taught, uh, classes that I took in learning about Plato and Aristotle and uh, Socrates for Steve Martin, you know, and we call him Socrates. Uh, <laughs> the building about the, so the sophists, uh, the cases and the closing arguments that we argued in moot court and observed in, in the courtroom. Some of these lessons only dawned on me later. While these courses sounded like communication theory, the fact is, for me, they ended up being skills courses. They were training courses. I was being trained in communication skills. <clears throat> I, I 
and I, and I learned about why that really mattered, regardless of the discipline that I would pursue. And of course, at that time, I didn't know what it was going to be like. Or the career. There were, these were classes, and again, it happens that they were in the communication school that prepared me for my career in advertising, unlike any I might have gotten had I, had I been more formally trained. So we learned about Aristotle, and here's my, my, uh, my uh, take on Aristotle. He would have been a killer consultant. Aristotle had just been a killer consultant um, because he, he, he taught us things about the art of, uh, of persuasion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, among his ideas about business was how to be persuasive, obviously. Persuasion not as manipulation, but persuasion as an art form. The coming together of logic and ethos, I'll talk about these more in a moment, emotion for the purpose of prevailing in debate or argument. I have come to believe, and others certainly share this view, is that persuasion is a skill. It's something that can be learned, and it's something that can be developed. And this is a lesson that stayed with me throughout. It helped me understand how to create empathetic communication strategies, evaluate which of the number of alternatives would make the most effective ad, how to navigate through consumer issues, create a presentation, convince a concerned client why a courageous idea would be the right course to take for corporate brand. Here's, uh, I pulled this off on LinkedIn. Uh, Aristotle is, uh, no, I didn't really do that. Just, there, there we go. Um, and if some of you have heard me talk a little bit today. This is, this is, a, this is a lesson I'm going to stay with me, and it, it sounds like a soundbite for the entire graduate's uh, coursework and graduate study. <clears throat> I didn't know it at the time, but this Aristotelian combo play of logos, logic, facts, uh, uh, ethos, trust, ethics, and emotions, pathos, could work for the man in the toga back then and for the guy in the suit and the woman in her suit on Madison Avenue today. When these elements come together and inform a carefully crafted argument, actually really become that carefully crafted argument, the odds of prevailing with your idea, creating an ad, a paper, performing well in a job interview, or while building a all grow exponentially. Learning how to communicate more effectively, incorporating these principles, taking counsel from them, was a skill that would cascade over every other subject matter and circumstance I ended up confronting, and in fact, confront today. I, I would submit it's not going to be any different for you. Just to carry on about this for another moment, my communication in law class with the then department chair and remarkable Dr. Crawford was actually a class about communicating in business. It was a class about advertising, not just law. It was about communicating often simultaneously to different target audiences. For example, the judge and the jury. With respect to the judge who sits in the audience today, it was about the press and a prospective customer. It was about a mom and a kid talking to them at the same time often. It was about the difference between fact and perception. The power of nuance or twist of phrase, the gesture, the preparation imperative, the power of confidence that's derived from knowing more than your opponent, and the role of each of these things in creating powerful, factual, emotional, and thus effective argument. I can assure you that it doesn't matter what your gig ends up being. A lot of you who raise your hands may well be accountants, maybe supply chain management, maybe in distribution management, economics, or sales. It doesn't matter. It turns out that there were business lessons taught in the school on the other side of campus, and that communication skills were an inherent part of success, driving success in this building here, in this in the disciplines involving business. And perhaps, perhaps this for another time, we should talk about and think about how we can make it easier to marry these, these disciplines. Uh, and because we there's, there's shared interests, building bridges and not just, just constructing silos. And I'm not saying that that's, that that's the case. And maybe none of that matters. If I, it's not an indictment of anyone's curriculum, but I would have you as, as job aspirants think about it this way. You can be, regardless of the, your academic pursuit, regardless of the number in front of the course that you're taking, you can be the architect of your own curriculum. And I don't care if you're senior, you're about to get your degree. That doesn't matter because you're going to be building your brand. You need to 
developing your career curriculum for a long time, or I certainly hope so. Is you build yourself a curriculum that's more, more holistic, horizontal, not just silo or specific, across academic, cultural, geographic, or any other borders that exist. Be less predictable in, your, in doing that. And again, it doesn't need a course number but to add value to your prospects or to your life. For me, this is an argument about lifetime learning. That, and I'll say this in another context in a moment. You're getting this degree in a couple of minutes or a couple of years does not get you to the end zone. It gets you to the kickoff. I mean, God, don't you hate sports analogies? <laughs> that's, just, that's, not the, that's not a highly trained speaker using those, I can assure you. Um, again, it turns out, sorry, sorry, I keep losing my place here. It took me for a long time to understand what, now that I'm in, in, in my career, it took me a long time to figure out, and, and this is something that we've again talked about some of the classes this week. I learned that advertising wasn't about entertainment. You know, we all love to sit in our sofas and watch the Super Bowl commercial. It wasn't about winning awards, which is a big, big credential in the business. Making creatives happy, I'll talk about them later. Or having a laugh over cocktails or serving, uh, or keeping a client happy in, in the service business. <clears throat> Advertising is all about communication, yes, but at its core, it's a product business. And the whole point is to create a better product, a more effective product. In this case, the product is, in advertising, obviously, the product is work. It's an ad, it's a film, it's a bit of merchandise, uh, it's a sign, it's a point of sale, it's an outdoor board, it's a website, or maybe a new business presentation, something that I ended up doing uh, a lot of later on in my career. It's important to warn you, you probably already learned this in your life, there's an endless torrent of people through whom an idea must pass. And for the most part, almost all of them can only say no. The work needs advocates. I don't care if you're in, you're an accountant, or you're in, in, in a communications function. And advocates need skills. They need the power to persuade. And this, of course, works when you're uh, looking for a job. I just want to talk a second about uh, this no thing again. No is like the enemy of the great. No rarely needs the boss's approval. In, in light of this, strong advocates need strength. They need confidence and courage. They need to activate every available persuasive tool. And this is going to be true for you. Again, I, I don't care if your business is in the, in the numbers. Advocates need confidence. They need courage. They need to exercise, improve, continually sharpen, and constantly develop. They need to learn and then relearn how to develop their persuasive abilities. Just the same with exercise, device. You'll work out all the time. You've got to do that in terms of what your career, uh, where it will take you. Which leads me awkward, our, our platform transition here back to what, what I was doing. I, I had a choice in completing my master's degree. I've been accepted to some PhD programs. I wanted to go to, and the one specifically I wanted to go to the University of Oregon, uh, or do something else. And as the date became to accept or reject that particular teaching assistance offer, I just could not at that point in my life imagine being in, in academia for another three or four years, the period of time it would take while teaching my way through that, earning my key to, uh, to continue on in academia. So I took, instead of a right turn, I took a left turn, and ended up in, in LA. And I was very fortunate. I was also in culture shock. That's, that's another thing. Uh, within two weeks of arriving there, I was lucky I got a couple of informational interviews at the LA offices of big New York-based agencies. Uh, during the second of these, a nice, a nice man started off by saying, you don't have a job, thank you very much. Uh, but it kind of took the pressure off and actually talked, and I was no longer performing. I was listening, sort of being myself. But he had a thought. A guy who worked at the agency just a moment ago had just left to join another agency in New York that would be opening an LA office to handle their newly acquired business, the Dotson business, which is now he's on. He would be uh, leading the dealer area of the business, which is really a communications function and not an advertising function. Uh, they, would, they were charged with the responsibility ability of developing relationships with their retail distribution of the dealers. As I said, it would not be directly 
you've got to know something about advertising component in this particular position. It would be, again, principally communications, not advertising. The job description, interact with the dealers in the Western United States, use their, uh, uh, interact with the, the, the uh, regional directors that were in four markets in Portland and Denver, San Francisco and Los Angeles. Keep, keep current on competitive activity, inventory levels, who's doing what promotions at what given point in time, uh, and travel. Uh, make sure they love us was really the brief that I was given. Uh, what, I, what I said to myself was, you don't know Diddley, Sherwood, but this might work. I didn't know what advertising. And oh, by the way, I paid money, which would have been a, a real nice bonus, something I hadn't received much of in the past. Mm -hmm. He introduced me on the phone to the guy who you know, a week later hired me when I had my first real business boss. My most, the most cogent recollection of this moment was that they got to be kidding. It was complete disbelief. And so my improbable journey into advertising began. Let's review. Humanities, speech communication, rhetorical theory, teaching, academic track rejected in favor of a job in the heart of the business world without any formal training of any kind whatsoever. A win-win situation, right? right? What I had been thinking about, as I said, was academia, but business ended up happening. And what I really thought about was teaching and advertising ended up happening. And ignorant of the implications of all of this, that's what I thought. Sweet. All right. It turns out, actually, it turns out that I was very well prepared, but I just not, had not been traditional. I had not come through the business school. I came through another route, and then I'm working on it all right. Worked to my advantage. I'm going to transition now. I'm going to tell you a little bit about, very quickly, I'm not even going to talk about these. Hopefully, we'll have some time. To, we need to have some time to talk if you choose to. I worked at a bunch of advertising agencies along the way. It doesn't matter if you know any of these. You know, a group of MTBW is shy I'm going to talk about them in a while. FCB is where I actually ran, had to run the Nintendo business in the US. I ran the Levi Strauss business. We launched the Dockers brand. How Riding Partners, but this is How Riding Partners was at the time perhaps the most creative agency in the country. We launched the Saturn brand from there. Goldberg was our nail had formerly been shy day. We bought ourselves out of that, did that, and then I ended up. Well, it's not on my resume, which is, it's not on my, the introduction, this is my, my fault. I ended up in Detroit for eight years, beginning at a place called the MBNB. We rebranded that Darcy, and then as, as happened in so many business, businesses, part of the Leo Burnett bought us with Dentsu, the largest single agency brand in the world from Tokyo. And that whole thing was in turn purchased by publicists. None of that matters right now, a lot of it. These are among the brands that I've worked on. Uh, I've been really lucky, uh, and well, the, uh, those agencies, um, sorry, I, I did, on these brands, uh, just about everything you can do, I was really lucky. I briefly worked in media, I helped launch <coughs> truly remarkable brands, Saturn and the Dockers, the Key Motors brand in the United States, I ended up writing some advertising for the launch of the VA Sports, um, I'm going to show you some work Past it's a new product work for Coca Cola, managed the General Motors brand across the globe for our, our agency, did the repositioning and restaging of Cadillac a few years ago. So I've been very, I've been very lucky. Uh, my last position in the mainstream agency world, I ran eight. Uh, the irony of all of that is with success, and I said this was a product business, with success, I kept getting pushed. There was, it, it, it's an odd and it's to be resisted as, as you move through your career. The odd gravitational pull is that you were really good at doing product stuff, and the better you got, the farther away management pushed you from doing what you did. Why? Well, you're going to manage more people. You're going to manage more offices. You're going to manage finances. You're going to manage all that. And that was, a, that was a constant conflict. I mean, my last position, I ran six North American offices, was on the board of directors, and was a global account director for the General Motors. All right, what I'm going to do now is, uh, most people will advise me not to do this, I'm doing it anyway. I'm going to show you some advertising, and it's old, and that's about as nice a resolution as you're going to find. I pulled most of it off of YouTube. Uh, I didn't keep it all. If I had it, it was on a videotape that's since disintegrated or something. But I wanted to show these because I had a hand in these, and I'm proud of it as personal work. I didn't do the writing necessarily, or the art direction, I didn't do it by my camera to be sure, but I was part of the team that created these. 
The first one is just that, and I know this is going to look like if it comes out of you know the Mesozoic period. I understand that. You're going to look at the oddness of their the wardrobes and all that. But if you can think about the, the strategy behind this, and if we have time, I'd love to talk to you about this. This is for Levi's 501s. Hopefully, this sounds good. Not work.
time after time after time again. The great work that we ended up doing, and some of what, what I am proud of, is that we really understood the person we were talking to and their needs. Arguing your point of view and prevailing involves understanding the other guy's point of view. Your practice in the, in the communication forum, when you practice for a formal debate, you actually have to take the opponent's point of view as part of getting ready for advocating your own. <clears throat> Said differently here, the, the whole point of what I did in my career in advertising, and, and if you're in sales, whatever, it's going to be the same thing. The whole point of it is them, not us. The, the chairman of the board of Procter & Gamble not long ago said, we no longer own our brains, consumers own our brains. <clears throat> and just because you're an engineer or an accountant doesn't mean who they are, your, your, your audience, doesn't mean that all they need are numbers. The best advertising, the best work, regardless of the industry or academic pursuits, understands and has empathy with the person to whom it, to whom it addresses. I'm not going to talk much about this right now because we don't have the time. One of the corollary here is, and it wasn't my point, is that, it, and, and, and it's particularly relevant to you who are thinking about marketing, if, if you were to really think about your audience as consumers, uh, I think you, you, you uh, diminish their influence in the process. They're people. This is something that you will continue, I hope you will learn. You will watch people doing what they do. The people have needs. Consumers are some academic or some sort of, uh, some lofty notion that it doesn't, uh, doesn't help us at all. Diversity. Diversity is important. The more diversity group, the better the outcome. The more relevant, the more depth, the more, the more traction, the more inspiration an idea will have. This goes beyond political correctness, to be sure. It is about the richness of ideas, about color, about cultures, about uh, geography, religion, social system, economic backgrounds, uh, economics, people who are different from us. Diversity is complex, it's diverse, and it is freaking beautiful. But I would suggest that you consider diversity from a different point of view. Without question, the best problem solvers are those who find the most creative, unexpected solutions. You're, when you go to that interview, they aren't hiring a graduate, they're hiring a problem solver, or they're hiring a revenue generator. <clears throat> the people who tend to be the most creative, the, the, the thing beyond their discipline or background, as a, a young a woman said in one of the persuasion classes yesterday, beyond her major, which I thought was a good way of thinking about it, um, the ones that, the think about that beyond the discipline or background are inherited set of assumptions. Problem solvers don't restrict their ideas, search for ideas to what is familiar or comfortable, historic or digital, known or unknown. They never assume that what they know or their point of reference right now has to be the source of the solution now or at any other time. The majority of you who are business students may just want to consider this. I've, I've hired, so you refer to this, I've hired by literally hundreds of people in my career. It certainly influenced the hiring of maybe a thousand. More, I, I don't know. I can't recall ever hiring an MBA student an MBA. And while sitting in the business school, I, I, I asked you, listen, that's not because they weren't good people, it wasn't because they weren't smart, it wasn't because of the school they came to. It was because of what I witnessed and believed to be an often limited life perspective. This has implications for your personal branding. If you can think through who you're talking to, what their needs are, just think about the person who's interviewing. What are they going through? What are their needs? Is that simple step? And what's the mission of their company? You'll, you'll, you'll learn to be better. <clears throat> I won't say much more about this than to give you one example. Um, I was running the Pizza Hut business. Lee Cloud, who if any of you were reading, read about Steve Jobs recently, Lee Cloud is in almost every article. He's the most decorated, probably, maybe, maybe possibly the best ever creative director, still the creative director for for uh, Shai Dang is responsible for most of the Apple advertising we, we all admire. We won the FD Award, this American Marketing Association Award for the most uh, effective, or the, the best creative that had its intended marketplace effectiveness. I'm, I'll go through this quickly. We were shooting commercials in Ben Carver, Michigan, I'll never forget. The place was packed largely because we had a huge crew there and there was a lot going on. It took forever to get our pizza. I had insisted when we got the business that I go through the training class for how they make a pizza in a franchise, a pizza franchise restaurant. The place was packed. They were all, they weren't ready for us. I asked the manager if I could come back there and help cook, help do the pizzas. 
He said, yeah, I put on the apron and we got to the rush. The reason I'm mentioning this is 15 years later, uh, Lee Plow, who, who continued to be, I don't want to say a close friend, but certainly a respected uh, colleague, called me and asked me to be the president of Shia Day. And he cited that experience, and he get my hands dirty, tomato sauce under the fingernails, as evidence of why I'd be a great leader. And I turned that down for a variety of reasons at the moment are material. <clears throat> Uh, this is arguably a variation on the uh, dirty thing and something you may have heard. This is something I want you to think about, and particularly as all of you have, have uh, zeros and ones running in your veins. Uh, I, 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 while the, the miracle of technology is just that miraculous, getting out from the computer, going out in the real world, engaging with real consumers if that's what's relevant, going out and witnessing how sales calls work if that's relevant, sitting in and listening to a conversation in a real accounting firm, if that's relevant, engage, and then, and then begin to form a point of view. And assume that even though grounded in your own personal value system, what you've learned in school, what you've learned in a career, but that point of view over time may change. Why? Because everything else is changing. You want to add some values, of course. I want that. Uh, in virtually every class that I've visited this week, it came up that students are having trouble writing well. Making a cogent argument using a you know, keyboard or a pen. Uh, and this is something you want to correct. And it's nothing you should feel badly about. And this is nothing that's, that's, that's singularly about this campus, this school, none of that. This is a problem in our society. So you get practice writing. And if you get a comment that says, this is more well-written or rewrite, do not hang your head. Go fix it. You can learn how to write a good paragraph. You can learn what it's like to just have a composition uh, that has you know, start with what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and you tell them what you tell them. These are things you actually did here in fifth grade or whatever it was. But those basic rules will help me. I cannot tell you how many, how many candidates we have had to reject because they didn't write a complete sentence. Or they didn't care to make sure their argument on their own behalf was a coaching point. It was well thought out. And, and the best writers make the best readers. The last one I'm going to talk about here is, uh, I'm going to borrow a line from Shai Day, uh, which was indisputably the best creative agency of its time. I continue to believe it's certainly one of the top uh, two or three. Um, in the agency world, where people, were, where people are generically uh, uh, referred to by the department they work, this is an account person, that's the world they also publish the students. Uh, this is a creative, this is a planner, this is a, this is a traffic person. And then in an advertising agency world, the creative person obviously exists in the vortex of an agency's purpose to create advertising. And agencies are in the, the product business, the creativity business. But as I mentioned to you, surprise, it's a product business. Though the creatives are the engineers that have a unique, and a unique product development model, they build things that in turn must change things, perceptions, or behavior. That kind of thing. Uh, but it's pretty hard for two people sitting in a queue, staring at the walls, asking each other, what if? Uh, to his credit, Jay Shia, uh, who I was very fond of, he's no longer with us, whose name he gives you to see some of the best advertising that's ever been. And with every, uh, from everything he did, he thought differently about this. <clears throat> Read that creativity is not the sole purview of any department. Just because you're an accountant doesn't mean you can't bring creative, I don't mean creative accountancy in the sort of Wall Street sense, and you can't bring, you, know, you can bring a, you can bring a new thought, a new way to do it, a new way to approach a prospect, a new way to think about a client's problem. You can do that. It doesn't matter if you write ads. You can do that if you're a nurse. You can do that if, if you're a communicator. The goal is to be the best in whatever you do. And in our case, a creative agency, it made no sense that the purview of creativity existed solely in the department. It had to be everyone. How can you be the best unless the person reaching the door believes that, that they're there for a creative purpose, that the person wearing the tie is there for a creative purpose, the person behind the camera is there uh, for a creative purpose. I'm a, uh, this, this is the, uh, kind of sums up a lot of what I said. I, I, I've talked too much, I have too much material, uh, cut myself short in a few areas. I'm wondering if any of you want to talk about any of this, if you have any questions. I know 
that there is an opportunity, you probably all have classes, but there's an opportunity in a few minutes to go downstairs and, and talk about some of these things. Uh, I'm grateful for being here. I really am, and I apologize for those, the speed and some of the technical things we have. Is there anything anybody would like to, to ask me about anything? Sir, Tom. Patrick, not a question. I just, uh, I'm Tom Andrews, I'm director of the School of Communication. I just want to thank you for keeping alive the things that you learned 30 years ago from our program. Right. And I want to let you know that that master's degree in communication still exists here. If anybody's thinking about you know, what to do next, it's an evening program. Russ over here is in the master's right now. This semester, uh, the classes Dr. Allen, who just had to leave to get to her class, is teaching that rhetorical criticism course, mm -hmm. where you learn about deconstructing the arguments. The ethos, the ethos and logos are still there. Right. Um, Rock on, the ethos. Rock on. <laughs> uh, the other class, you know, personal communication, learning the face-to-face, one-on-one, right. be it with your relational partner, supervisors, subordinates, yep. the entities. And I teach a class in popular culture where we're deconstructing advertising, TV, internet, film, music. So. Uh, Great program. That's great. Yeah. Anybody? Any question? Something pop up? Could you talk about yeah. how you inspire courage to get those courageous ideas through? Because um, that's, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it, is, it sounds a little easier to say than do, doesn't it? Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, and it is easier to say than do, but I, I, I will go back to something I said in here is that, I mean, you, have, you obviously have to have talent. You have to have a, uh, and I believe, but repeating myself, I think you need to have a world view of things. I don't think you need to be so microscopic in your thinking. But one of the things I, I think where courage comes in is with preparation. Um, I, you know, I, I, I haven't had it for a while. I'm just getting in front of this, the, the, you guys this morning, the adrenaline starting to move, and you say, was that coffee or what's going on? In the new business world, the business development world, that, that sense was all the time. And the most successful endeavors in that, in that uh, respect were when I or we were the most prepared. We knew more than our competitors, and we knew more than our client about what the subject was, about their customer. I don't know if you have I, I, one of the most, this is, this is a bit of a dating example. We, uh, I, I used it a little bit uh, the other day. It was a mid-sized steak restaurant. It used to be called Stewart and, and Anderson's, and it's become something else now. They just got bought by someone. So a lot of rich guys were walking in, we want an ad agency, what are you going to do for us? And they really, truly knew about money, but they didn't know about their customer. They didn't have a clue about who she was, he was, what that family was like. And that was going to be hard because we didn't want to say, would you get out of your limo and get into the real world? They can't do it that way. But what we could do is know more about their customer than they did. And so in our pitch, in that case, the, in that pitch, we actually created a room. We made a room. That's a room that was obviously it was manufactured in our heads, but it's a room like you would find at the home of somebody who was going to go to eat at one of their restaurants. And that, that was a courageous decision, but it's also relatively easy. We were prepared. It was database that came out of media thinking. And what ends up happening, we, there, was a, there was a gun locker, there was some lottery tickets, there was a baby carriage, there was a Cubs hat, I think. There was, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and what we did, we talked, we, the whole presentation was in that sort of living area. We made it up. And, and it, it doesn't sound like a big deal right now, but it was a very courageous thing given the, the nature of both those people. But I think more than anything, I, I think this is a public speaker, but I also believe it as a, as a business person. If you know your facts um, and you have conviction about your mission, and in, a, in the case of almost every agency, except the first one where I didn't realize what the product was, which was a product business. When, once I knew those things, all of a sudden, courage was a lot easier. It was, okay. yeah, you're worried about losing business. We're not getting it. And it was really, you know, it's a real grind. It's a real competitive world. But, when you, I, you know, it made so much sense when I could say something with conviction. Because I knew about it. I knew that, that customer better than they did. And then let the chips fall where they may. They're not going to buy our act if what they want is mediocrity. Or they want okay ads or ads that they've seen before. And then, then, then you do get courage. And it, it, it's, that's helpful. But I would say, if, you know, if nothing else, preparation would be singularly what where courage came from for me. Anybody else? All right. I wish you well in your uh, your brand development efforts. Uh, you've got a big task before you. The last thing I'll say, as Lynn comes up here, 
is that I think there's, a, I've said this in virtually every forum this week, there is a lot of black crepe out there. The economic world sucks. The Dow down today, 300 points because the Italian banks are, sorry, and the world looks like it's, oh my God. I would submit this, that you are living in the most exciting possible time in history. And the opportunities for you are enormous. The fact is, the jobs you're going to get in a year, two, five, haven't even been invented today. You have amazing options. You have access to information like that, which any generation preceding you has ever had. Make something of it. Make something of it. Have some courage. Get uncomfortable with being comfortable. And, uh, and have, some, have some fun. There you go. Thanks.